Ashley, Samantha, are you ladies there? Hi, how are you? Good, how are you doing? Great. Yep, I'm here. All right. Well, we should be going live here. I'm just waiting for it to pop up on YouTube. Do you guys have somebody in the chat watching for questions? Yeah, I'll have it up. Super. And you guys are doing what, two tiered supports checking for understanding with Study Island? Yes, that's what we're working on. Cool. All right, looks like we're live and ready to go. Hello all, I am Jim Unger with JCPS Digital Innovation. You are on the Digital Learning Live channel, jcpsdigitallearning.com. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're going to be joined by Samantha Bennett and Ashley Byerly, and we are gonna be talking about tiered supports, checking for understanding with Study Island. If you want, you can check out our virtual training schedule over at the jcps.me forward slash NTI page. Click on the teacher toolkit, go to the live channel schedule, and you can see all of our live trainings that we have for this week. All right. Ashley and Sam, are you guys ready to take over? Samantha, sorry. I'm ready when you are. All right, outstanding. I switched it over to you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're here to continue our sessions from yesterday about tiered supports and how to check for understanding. We know that this is a very difficult time, so we are not here to add more work to your plate. We are here to help strengthen the work you're doing and actually make it easier for you. So we're going to go through some different slides. And I know at the beginning, um, whoops, I forgot to share my screen, didn't I? I'm so sorry about that. I know at the very first week, we agreed that like it was just a basic tutorial. How do we use Study Island? Well, we're going a little bit deeper today, now that we're a couple weeks into this to show you, now that you know how to use it, how can you really use it to differentiate your instruction and make life easier on your end, as well as uh, enhance the instruction that the kids are receiving. Hey, Ashley. Yes. Could you go to the bottom of your slides and turn on closed captioning right down there at the bottom where it says CC? Uh, yeah. Am I on now? Yep, there you go. And okay. you can hide that other button. No, that's fine. Okay, so uh, checking for understanding regarding Study Island. Number one, this is the way that you can contact us. Uh, our team is evolving. Currently, you know, we're trying to fill in some of those roles, but Sam and I are both here to support you guys. You as teachers, instructional assistants, interventionists, it, admin, it doesn't really matter. If you have questions, we are here for you. So you see our Twitter hashtag there, as well as our email and contact information of where you can reach us. We are with NTSS Academic, and our focus is tiered supports, but with that, we also recognize that it's also a multi-tiered system. And within the multi-tiered system, regardless of whether you're looking at tier one, tier two, or tier three, you have to check for understanding. And even though NTI is a hard time right now and people are just trying to navigate their way in this educational world, in order for us to determine whether students have met or have not met, the standard, we have to check for understanding. So this is still a pivotal point of instruction and it happens over and over and over in the instructional process. So this quote came from Fisher and Frey from an ASDD article that I found and I love the underlying part. It is difficult to know exactly what students are getting out of the lesson unless you check for understanding. And that's how we're gonna talk about today. How can we use Study Island to do just that? So on the JCPS assessment landscape, which this links you to if you would like to explore more, we talk about four types of assessments. And this graphic came from Susan Burkhart's book, How to Make Decisions with Different Kinds of Student Assessment Data. There are four types. There's the interim and benchmark assessments, which we would equivalent, which we would equate to MAP. We have accountability, which is KPREP. But you can see that those sections of the quadrant are actually small because they should not make up the majority of our instruction. 
Grading is the next largest because we recognize that summative grades have to happen and that can look a variety of ways, you know, whether it's a PBL task or whether it's in a test. But then if you look the largest section, classroom formative assessment strategies, just like the grading, it can look a multitude of ways. It can be anecdotal notes. It can be a multiple choice question, an exit slip. It can be a bell ringer. It can be a, um, a check for understanding five question assessment that's not graded. It makes up the bulk of your instruction. So in essence, this is how we want your assessment to look in your classroom. We want the majority of the assessments to be formative. How are you using those to determine the next instructional needs? So Study Island can pre-assess where we want to not waste our time. We can go on and see what students know before the unit. We can formatively assess throughout the unit to see are we making headway or do we need to back up rather than waiting to the very end when we provide a summative assessment after everything is over. Ideally, that summative assessment should be proficient because if we've checked for all of these other formative assessments along the way, the summative isn't going to tell us anything that we don't already know. So that's why the formative assessment quadrant takes up such a large bulk of your assessment landscape in the classroom. So a couple of weeks ago, we did talk about how to build a test in Study Island. And if you forgot, we have this link right over here to a Padlet that you are able to watch a quick video or read a quick tutorial about how to do that. For today, we just took screenshots as a quick review. But when you go into Study Island logging in through Clever, there's two ways to build a test. We're going to only focus on one. On the left of the teacher screen when you come in, you'll see a button that says Built Test Library. You will click that in order to determine what kind of test you want. So if you have created a test in the past, this Built Test Library is where you will find it. You would just select the program, like what grade level you, you teach, the subject, and any test, if you see here, that you've created in the past will appear. So created by me under that tab. Now you see the importance of naming your test specifically because chapter 10, chapter seven, they're very broad. I really don't remember what standards those assess. So I encourage you to be as specific as possible when you are naming your test. So that's where you would go if you've already built one. If you are looking to build a brand spanking new test, over here on the right, you click build a test. Now when you build a test, you will need to know what program grade level you're assessing, the subject you need. Think about what type of assessment you want. Study Island has a multitude of assessment question types, drag and drops, multiple choice, constructive response questions. They also allow you to do filter by DOK level. If I know that my standard I'm assessing is assessed at a DOK2 level, I need to make sure I include questions that get up to that level of rigor. There are assessment questions to choose from as well as practice questions to choose from. The difference is between that assessment, they've never seen these questions before. Practice, they have the potential to see them before. However, the chances of that are actually very small because Study Island's practice question bank consists over 600,000 questions. So the likelihood of a student seeing the same question twice is minimal. I'm not going to say it's not possible, but it is very small. You have an option. Just think about like, think about Google Drive for a second. When we create a document in Google Docs, we can share it, right? Study Island has the same potential. You can see up on the screen, there's a created by me tab and a created by others tab. And this was a big light bulb moment for me because when I was on a team and we were all making the same assessment four times, why with this is available? So I can create a test, whatever that looks like, and I can share it with my teammates and then they can assign it to their classroom. So this is a great collaborative feature. We tend to think of Study Island as an isolated thing for just us as individuals, but in fact, Study Island can be more collaborative in nature if we allow it to. So if you did that, you would just have to share a test. And once you share a test, 
And let's say Sam provides a test to me, I would find it in this created by others tab, not the created by me tab. But once we build this test, like I said, it's, under, it's important to know the grade level you're going to be assessing, what standard you will be assessing. In this case, I did an analyze elements of stories and drama. And then once the test questions, assessment choices pop up, I even took a screenshot of one of the examples that's provided that's different than a multiple choice question. I think we all are very familiar with those. But one of the components of 6.3 for language arts is that they can break down a plot and analyze how each of these elements lead to the overall plot. So this first has them identify in the passage which part matches with which text, which I think is a different way of looking at things. Here is where you can filter by question type. If I just want a constructed response question or if I just want multiple choice questions, I would choose that here. And I could filter by the depth of knowledge as well here. So once you provide a test to students, I know just like everyone, we're gonna be anxious to see those results. And there's many ways we can go about accept, accessing the results. The easiest way though, on the left-hand side, there's a school reports tab that's highlighted green here. In the middle of your screen where it's pointed, it says built test report. If I click on that, it's going to break down all of my student data into individuals. We can look at, at it by assessment question in order to determine a real analysis. But if you look over here, this is where it becomes important about choosing a test name that's specific. You can see here that Sam Bennett created a, she wanted a school built test for this Bennett homeroom. If she had just put chapter seven before, it wouldn't have told her much. But here she understands that this is assessing the standard four in F1 with equivalent fractions. Now, if she knows she's going to be giving four assessment checks along the way, she might need to name it even more specifically, equivalent fractions pretest, equivalent fractions check number one. It can look a variety of ways, but the more specific you are, the easier it is to access these results and so you can use those results the best way possible. So that's kind of a quick overview regarding what Study Island can offer. Um, we are sitting here kind of thinking through some ways about, we have the results, now what? Because in the NTI world, that's the hard part right now. We're not able to see these students person to person to have these conversations. So we have to work smarter and not harder. We have to find other ways of reaching them. So Sam is going to take over in just a second. And now that you have the results, we're gonna talk about what do we do with the results in order to differentiate for our students. So Sam, take it away. Sorry about that. I shared my screen a little bit too early and forgot to turn on my mic. So let me go ahead. <laughs> right. Hopefully that happens to a lot of people. It's not just me, right? <laughs> okay. So let me go ahead and present. And you want to close captioning on. Absolutely. So and you can hide that, that other that button. button. Great. You, okay. Can you hit hide on that Got one? It. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank sir. you. No worries. No worries. Okay. So I'm going to pick up where Ashley left off. So when you're in the build, report or build test report, you're going to hit this button view report. And when that happens, you are going to get this report. Now I went ahead and I highlighted some of these names so we could have a quick conversation about them, but the report's going to look the same. So assessment questions not only measure what students know, but can reveal different levels of knowledge and learning. Mistakes are part of learning, of the part of the learning process, but we need to analyze those mistakes to make sure they don't evolve into misconceptions. So when analyzing assessments, we need to think about the root problem. Is this a problem with the curriculum? Is it a problem with the instruction or the assessment? So looking at this uh, report, we can see each individual student. Um, we can look at a topic by topic basis, a class average, the student's overall score, which would be right here, this middle column, um, and that either you created or was created by a teammate at the same grade level, for example. So how did these students do? 
let's look at their overall percentages. Um, um, how can we can discriminate between students who have learned uh, what you have intended for them to learn versus those who have not quite mastered or met proficiency for that skill. So then we need to think about instructional supports. Um, how do we motivate students and help them structure their academic efforts? Do we need to reteach differently? We need to differentiate these student assignments. So for an example, I went ahead and highlighted in red Beth and Parker, and it looks like from their percentages, they only answer 20% of the questions correctly. So one out of those, you know, five assessment questions I made. Um, we need to provide intensive scaffolds for these kiddos to help them reach proficiency. Um, Pierce over here, he only um, got three out of the five test questions correct. So he has a 60%, which to me is not necessarily meeting proficiency. So how might we scaffold materials for him um, while the other kids, we can't forget about them. We also need to make sure that we're enriching their learning experiences as well. There's another test um, report that I would really like you to focus on, and this is test item analysis. Um, I know I talked last week about underutilized tools, and this would be another one in Study Island. And this is what it looks like when you hit that button. Um, we're all probably very familiar with the old DAs and PAs um, using Cascade, and this is very similar. So we're gonna be looking at those test questions and students that um, got them correct versus incorrect. So we can really think about that root problem again. Um, assessment questions, again, they not only measure what students know, but they can reveal that different level of knowledge and learning. Um, are, and are all of these good questions? Did a lot of the students miss the same question? It looks like number four here, we had a really low percentage of kiddos that did not score well on that question. So we need to be very reflective our assessments just like we are in our lessons and tasks that we give to our students. Um, so I know that Ashley a couple of weeks ago and me last week we talked about um, different scaffolding. What can we do when we realize that kids here, here, they might need a little bit more scaffolding or instructional support, um, this kiddo too. So what we have made for you is um, additional resources to consider when you're thinking about how you are going to um, go back and provide those enrichment activities. So when thinking about creating another lesson or assessment or enrichment activity of any sort, we recommend going back to the standards. And we went ahead and link those for you right here. Um, so if you click on math, they'll take you to math standards, ELA, the ELA standards. And we didn't want you to forget that ELA shows this progression among state, uh, grade levels. In math, um, it's a it's in the little corner at the bottom, um, but we, there's other opportunities for us to explore content. So we can also go to achieve the core. I did talk about that a little bit last week, um, but this week I want to focus on their coherence map. Um, if you have not utilized the coherence map for math, uh, you are missing out big time. So I hope this is your one nugget that you're going to take away. Um, when you go to achieve the core, and this is, I just zoomed out so you can see it. Um, but when you go to achieve the core, if you click on coherence map, you're going to input the grade the domain and then that standard, and then it's going to give you, um, this map of where the standard came from and you can highlight it go back to that standard then if you need uh, some additional resources or you need to think hmm, all these kids got it what are my next steps where's the standard going it then shows you where the standard could go um, if you click on the specific standard i absolutely love these features it gives you example tasks it gives you um, some assessment questions. It talks about the progression of the standard, some really great stuff. Um, additionally, we want you to go back and we want you to utilize those school programs that and resources that you have in your building. Um, if your building has chosen to follow a specific program, um, utilize those resources. Um, additionally, go and check out the JCPS curriculum frameworks. Um, some awesome information there. Um, it also shows you um, previously what standards you have covered and what standards are coming up next so that you can make a nice coherence in your lessons. So kind of just to review what are anticipated um, 
cycle would be, would be to make lessons using these resources. Um, it would be to give that assessment. Look at that student assessment data. Check out the item analysis or all those questions, good test questions. And then what are we gonna do for next steps for that delivery of instruction? Um, just a side note, if you're thinking about other resources that you could utilize, NWEA has that learning continuum. Um, however, I do wanna caution you because once you start beginning a teaching a standard or a skill that is old data so we need to reassess building those study island assessments so what i love this feature as a classroom teacher um, because it just made life a little bit easier and we all know that sometimes life could just be a little bit easier so i would use this tool this create a class and here's a quick video it's a very nice tutorial it does step by step by step as to how um, you can create a class and I would utilize this tool when forming groups. So remember Beth and Parker that needed that extra support in that specific standard? I could create a new class. So once you go to class manager, you're just going to hit add a class. You're going to title it. Be again, very specific. Ashley talked to you earlier about making sure that uh, that build a test test um, title was very important. It's also important here, too. So you know what groups that you're picking and that'll just make your life easier. Um, you are going to um, name once you name it, then you're going to hit whatever homeroom class those kiddos are in and you're going to expand it by clicking uh, that plus sign so you can see all the kiddos and you're going to click 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 their names and then you're going to hit save don't forget to hit save if you do you will not save that class learn that one the hard way so that's a teacher tip um so this when you're assigning um, those specific activities for those kiddos that may need it. Um, it's really easy. You don't have to go scrolling down your whole list every time, find the name, click it. Um, it. It just saves you a bunch of time. So this is one, you know, way to help yourselves a little bit. However, I do want you to know, because I, I freaked out too when I first did this, you are not removing your students from your homeroom class. They're just now going to be in two different classes. So one, I want you to think about your homeroom as that grade level standards. And then that additional small group, you're going to be thinking scaffolds. Um, and again, if you are really struggling with creating a class, check out this video. So let's put this all together. <clears throat> this is our process and I know it's a little bit hard to read, but I promise it will make sense to you in just a moment. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide instruction and it's probably going to be phenomenal. Okay. Um, give yourself a little bit credit. I have seen some of the great choice boards you guys are making some of the awesome assignments. I could not be more proud to be a JCPS teacher. Um, and then we're going to build that assessment. Once you build that assessment, we're going to check and we're going to use that data to determine Hmm, which one of my kiddos um, are exceeding expectations or met expectations and which group maybe needs more support. Based off of that data, we can then differentiate with additional scaffold activities or if they met or exceeded expectations, we can differentiate with enrichment opportunities. But the most important part is knowing where your kids are. So no matter if you give them enrichment opportunities or additional scaffolds, you still need to reassess for their understanding. Um, here's a caveat to all of that. If less than 80% are succeeding in tier one core instruction, what you're giving to everybody, then your core needs to be strengthened. Um, and you need to make sure that you also reassess and reevaluate how they did. So, so and sometimes that happens. I am 100% guilty of giving a lesson I thought was incredible. Um, I gave an assessment. It turns out maybe it wasn't so credible after all. But going back, being reflective and going back makes you that awesome teacher that you are. Um, and then you can just reteach at that point. So we wanted to leave you with a couple of great resources because what teacher does not love some great resources all in one place? So again, here are some study island resources. We talked about those student work bundles, uh, the Padlet, and then the successful e-learning day blog last week. Um, Ashley left you these great facts and uh, FAQs so that if you have any additional questions, that is kind of your go-to place, as well as um, parent letters if you want to send them home or print it as a, you know, bunny ear, print it as a PDF and put it on your Google Classroom. 
Um, here are some of those great math resources again and back that popular demand. Here are the manipulatives. And I left you another little nugget this week um, because who doesn't love a good surprise? So all of my K through eight teachers, if you click on this most misunderstood math standards, you are going to find by grade level all of the standards that they have collected data on that show where kids have the biggest gaps so that you can go ahead and clean up those misconceptions before they even started. Um, additionally, we talk a lot about scaffolding strategies, and if you're sitting there thinking, scratching your head, hmm, what's a scaffolding activity or strategy? We left you a couple of these. This is not an exhausted source uh, resource. This is just um, to get you started. So if your kiddos need sentence stems or frames um, to help them progress through a lesson, or maybe to speak like a mathematician. This would be a really good place to start. Maybe they just need graphic organized to organize their thoughts. Um, and that is for math, ELA, social studies, science. Like this is not limited to just math and reading. Um, if you have not had a chance to check out this um, eight key practices for supporting ELs, please do so great resources. I use it all the time as a classroom teacher. And then additionally, we didn't want to forget our middle and high uh, people. So if you are looking for some vocabulary apps, here's a good one for you. So hopefully you leave today with one nugget. And if you need additional support, please feel free to reach out to me or to Ashley and calling me Sam is completely fine. <laughs> And I think Sam just basically hit it on the head. This is a cycle. You know, this is not an exhaustive thing that you're going to go through one time. I already had a teacher reach out to me today and she said, I created all of my small groups. I see all of my data and it has stayed there. But now I have like 20 classes. And I said, well, it's all going to be OK, because at the end of this, you can either delete the class or archive the class. So it might look like a lot now in terms of groups but it's really not overwhelming as a teacher. It's just kind of, you've got to organize it in your own head. And you know, once you assign those tests, they become locked. So make sure you kind of have an idea of what you want before it even starts. So um, thank you for joining us today. I hope you took something from this. If anything, check for understanding and let Study Island help you instead of you having to recreate everything in already such a crazy world. Sam, do you have anything left to add? Hope everybody has a great right. Tuesday. Right. Yes. Have a great one. Absolutely. Thanks Thank for you, ladies. Uh, there's so many resources in there, great planning tools, a lot of just great information um, in all content areas. It's awesome. All right. Those of you just joining us, I'm Jim Unger with JCPS Digital Innovation, and you are on the Digital Learning Channel Live. And we will be continuing with our resources throughout the day. Next up, we have facilitating virtual restorative circles with Madeline and Sandra. And I do believe they're on our call already. How are you ladies doing this afternoon? Just great. There you doing are. well, can you guys hear me okay? Absolutely, and I see you sharing your screen. While you're yes. doing that, if you would, once you get in presenting, you can hide that button hovering there in the middle. And if you would, turn the closed captioning on and the bottom black bar down there. It's the CC. There you go. There you go. And then when we talk, it should show up at the bottom. Although I'm not Hello? seeing it. I hear you. Oh, yeah, oh, I see it go. now. Oh, good. It's getting you, not me. That's all right. <laughs> You're the important one. <laughs> I don't know about all that. Well, that's what everybody's here for is you. I'm just fun <laughs> in the background. <laughs> All right, we are at 12.59, got about another minute here. Uh, right. Once again, if you haven't already checked out the NTI portal, jcps.me forward slash NTI, go to the teacher toolkit, which is where I'm at on my screen. And then you can pick up over here where it says virtual training schedule. You can see all of our great presentations that will be going on this week, and you can click on them and you have access to the presentations that they'll be using, which, as you saw in the last one, there's a lot of great resources inside of those also. All right, flip back here and get your screen up. And we are almost at one o'clock, so I will let you ladies take it away. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, as he said, uh, my name is Sandy Yates, and uh, along with uh, Maddie Heike, we are going to be presenting, doing this presentation. Um, while we are doing the presentation, um, just so you know, if you have any questions or you need anything, all you have to do is get on the chat, and we have some of our MTSS team on there monitoring that chat. So, Maddie, if you, thank you. Okay, so, again, my name is Sandra Yates. We are part of the Culture and Climate Department under the Assistant Superintendent of Dr. Katie DeFerrari. We also have our department lead, which is Dr. Na Naomi Brahim, as well as our uh, MTSS Behavior Coordinator, Sandra Hensel. We are made up in two different departments. Our first department is our MTSS Engagement. They work with the six toolkits. They help support the students there and the schools there. Um, and I am part of the MTSS Behavior as well as Maddie, and we help support schools with the positive behavior interventions and supports as well as restorative practices. Okay, so our learning intentions for today are, we will learn how to facilitate a circle and build relationships virtually. I know since all this crazy NTI stuff has started that all of you had begun building relationships in your classroom and really probably already had really good strong relationships. So we just want you to know that circles is gonna be a great way for you to be able to continue to uh, build those relationships with your students during this NDI time. Okay, so why should we do, do circles? We do circles to build relationships and to build community. Circles help us to give uh, people, people a voice. They also help to promote with uh, emotional well-being. And it, because circles allow for a safe place in order for people to talk about whatever's going on and, you know, whatever the question or prompt is that we're going to be talking about, it just helps them give them an opportunity to be able to speak. It also helps to empower change and growth, as well as inc increase responsibility and a safe place for, for people to go. That's the biggest thing is circles need to be safe. And the biggest takeaway we want you to get is circles don't have to just be done between you and students. Circles can also be done with, with each other, with teachers, through PLCs, through staff meetings, through admin meetings, through any kind of meetings, any group there where, where you get together before you get started, give your ch chance of self to, to work on those relationships. Because being, you know, with everything that's going on and, and all the social distancing, a circle is a great way that we can, you know, virtually get together and still be able to have a safe place to talk. Ultimately, we want to make sure that that circles, what they do is just create a, an opportunity for you to be able to, to speak, for you to be able to listen in a safe place that builds equity and uh, community. Great. Okay, ready? Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, like Sandy had said, my name is Maddie Heike, and I do MTSS behavior support for middle schools. Um, Sandy discussed in the previous slide about why we do circles, and I'm going to teach you now how to do circles with students and staff. The first step is um, to establish those circle norms. They can be as simple as respect others, being open to others' opinions, and being an active listener. Number two, stating the purpose of the circle. We tell students and staff why we are learning what we are learning or why we are at this staff meeting. And the same thing goes for circles. What is the purpose of the circle? Is it to build community, um, build relationships, or is it more content related? Giving that purpose really helps serve the circle for both students and staff. Number three, come up with a question that every person can answer. So if this is your first circle and you, you don't have very much experience with it, some good starter questions could be as simple as, what is something fun you did this weekend? Or um, what's the best part about online learning? Now, a question that wouldn't be as strong would be, what is your favorite vacation spot? This gets a little tricky simply because some students and staff may have never been on vacation before. So therefore, not everybody could answer that question. And lastly, have a way that each person can answer. Some students and staff may just not feel comfortable answering verbally. So giving them that opportunity to answer non-verbally if they choose. So those are kind of like the four main steps. And now I'm going to teach you how to do circles through Google Meet. So once again, setting up those norms, those expectations about how long an answer should be. Because, you know, some students, you may want a whole sentence and some students may 
give you just a um, just one word. So this is um, for number two. This is what we do in our MTSS behavior um, meetings. Um, the facilitator poses a question, calls each person by their name, and then they unmute themselves, answer the question, and then mute themselves again. So that's one way that we've done it and that we've all done it on the MTSS behavior side. Um, another thing that you can do is if you don't want to call on every person's name, because we understand that could take some time, you can simply do a thumbs up, thumbs down, or thumbs sideways. Simple questions such as, hey, how is how's everybody doing today? Thumbs up, I'm doing great. Thumbs down, I'm not doing so great today. And then a thumb sideways, I'm doing all right. Uh, number four, you could also do as simple as um, holding up fingers. Um, a, a classroom example could be, hey, how do we feel about that learning target today? Five, I feel great. I could teach somebody else. One, I'm still kind of struggling and need some assistance. A staff example could be as simple as, hey, we're going to be rolling out this new PLC protocol sheet. Five, I feel great. I can help my team members with it. One, I'm, a, I'm struggling. I'm going to need some assistance. And then the last way that you can do a circle in Google Meet is by using that chat feature. Facilitator comes up with a question, prompts all the participants to answer, and then the facilitator can simply read off some of those responses. So many different ways you can do circles in Google Meet. And now I'm going to talk about how you can do circles in Google Classroom. So once again, setting those expectations, how long do you want answers to be, um, making sure if you want them to be one sentence, specifying that. Um, a facilitator can ask a question and then allow all people in the classroom to respond. And then for number three, I love this idea of, um, you know, creating a Google form to complete and have the facilitator share those results. So a classroom example for an English class could be, you know, who's your favorite character and why? The next day you get on Google Classroom and you share, wow, 65% of you all really like Tom. Here are some of the reasons why. All right, and then I think Sandy is taking over with some circle ideas. Okay, there's several different circle ideas that we can we can do. One is a very simple check in, check out, like Maddie was saying, just asking how are you feeling today? What was a high point of, of your day? How was a high point of your weekend? What are you looking forward to? You know, what was your favorite thing about today? Anything that's just a simple, quick check in, check out. Um, next thing could be integrating, you know, course content, whether it's your language arts, whether it's science, social studies. Whatever it is, you can have ask a question about something you've been learning or something that you already know about what you're, you're about to start studying if you're studying a new subject. It kind of gives you an ability to kind of, you know, just touch base with the kids to see where they're at with their learning. You can also have proactive behavior discussions. Like Maddie was saying, we really need to make sure that we have our norms. So maybe we have something else new that we're going to be trying, like, you know, some of the games or something. And we need to make sure that we go over those expectations so that the students understand what it is you need them to be doing during that time. Um, the next one is, is the games, just giving people a brain break. It's really important during this time when everybody is so stressed out about, okay, how am I going to get all this done? Work, play, anybody, you know, it's just, we're having a lot of trouble with that. So giving people a break and allowing them to just have a little fun because we, we want learning to be fun and we want to remain giving kids and, and, and staff an opportunity to have a little fun with, with their work and with their job. Um, so on the next couple of slides, what we're gonna do is we're gonna give you a few ideas and examples that we, we have come up with. This one is called the um, unscramble. This can be used with anything you want. You can use students' names, you can come up with spring words, you can you know have just a variety of different uh, words that you choose. It could be content vocabulary. It could be your spelling words. It could be your English or your reading um, vocab words. Whatever words that you decide that you want to use, you put them on a piece of paper, you scramble them, and you can then have the kids figure out, you know, come up with an answer. This can be done in a variety of ways. Again, it could be like a Google form that you've had the kids fill out, that they put it on there. Or if they have figured one out, you can give them an opportunity to unmute and call out. Say, for example, number two, oh, that's can. And then you can do it that way. However you decide to do it, again, just make sure you set up those norms ahead of time. The next one um, is called the game change. I think um, if you, any of you have been in our restorative practices uh, circles, we've often played this game. It, what you have to do is you have to pick, pick a leader in the class, pick one student in the class, 
and have everybody focus on their face for like five seconds. Once they focus on that student's face, the student will then leave the screen and change three things about them. For example, they could, if they didn't have a hat on, they could put a hat on. For the girls, if they have their hair in a ponytail, they can take their hair down. You could change earrings, you can change whatever you want to change uh, uh, from you know what the, what the audience can see. And then they return to the screen and the other kids have to guess how, you know, what has changed. Again, you have to decide ahead of time how you want this to be, whether you do it in a chat and they, they type it in there or if they uh, unmute themselves and call things out. Another one that we um, came up with was the, um, oh, sorry, that's you, Maddie. <laughs> no worries. Um, so another idea that we had come up with, and I love a good scavenger hunt, um, this would be great if you're having, you know, a 90-minute staff meeting uh, via Google Meets and you just need a little brain break or you're having a lesson um, and students, you could just tell, need a little recharge. So you could just... Great. No, no worries. Is everything good? All right, great. I'll just um, redo this slide because I didn't know um, where I kind of cut off, but um, you're welcome. So um, another game idea that we had come up with is a scavenger hunt. I love a good scavenger hunt, and this would be great um, to use for a staff meeting. So say you're having a 90-minute Google Meet um, staff meeting, and it's just a good little brain break for staff. It also can be used for students. You can tell students maybe you're getting a little tired during a lesson. This is a great brain break for that. Um, so as you can see the example on the right, once the letter has been chosen, you have um, students and staff find something in their house that starts with that letter. So say right here, for example, it's a W, so they could go around and find a waffle maker, a watermelon, glass of water, and remind um, students and staff that it's okay if they can't find it, find anything and just to kind of brainstorm on their own something that they could find. And then once everybody is back, they can share kind of what they found and it just kind of brings some, brings some engaging uh, engagement to the um, staff meeting and or lesson. Lastly, um, I actually absolutely love this. This is um, from Google Slide and this is from a local elementary school, Klondike Elementary. So we're so thankful they allowed us to use this during their um, during our presentation, but this is a Google slide and staff and students can actually fill out their name on the colored boxes and this little moon that you see can actually move. And so the facilitator can move the moon around and allow people to answer the question. Now the questions that Klondike had come up with is what is your temp? Number two, what is your favorite thing slash most challenging part of working from home? So it's great because then people kind of know exactly when they're going and it gives um, kind of that feeling that you have a talking piece again. Lastly, we have a little few tips for success. We've kind of already reiterated this, um, or I mean, have already talked about this, but I will reiterate. Um, number one, make sure you're reestablishing those norms. Keep in mind, there will not always be a talking piece, especially if you don't do the Google slide. Um, number two, making sure that people may not feel comfortable virtually sharing. That's okay. Just know that they can pass, and if they want to come back, they can and share. Number three, if you're doing a check-in, making sure that that person that you're checking in, if somebody is saying that they're not doing well, check in on them and see what kind of supports you can offer. Lastly, if this is your first time doing circles, keep it light, keep it fun, keep it engaging. What is your favorite food or song? This increases participation and it also establishes that sense of safety for students and staff because it's a very light topic that everybody feels comfortable um, sharing. So lastly, any questions or comments? We're so thankful you all joined us today. Any comments or questions can be obviously put in that chat like Sandy had said earlier. We will be going, uh, the MTSS behavior team will also be going live tomorrow from 9.30 to 10 on classroom management for virtual learning. We'd love to see all of you all back tomorrow. And thank you guys for joining. Thank you for being here. We absolutely appreciate it. Um,
amazing stuff and you know make, making sure the students are comfortable with sharing i think that's great because as uncomfortable as a lot of teachers are uh, you don't want to try and force students to talk because a lot of them are uncomfortable and they're new to this as well i think that was a great yes. point all right and while we're waiting and we see if any questions pop up in there but you've had some good people in there squishing questions for you giving some great answers i want to take a quick look if i can jump over here and well i would like to see what we've got going on in the twitter feed if you haven't already and you're on the live you can go down and subscribe to our live channel hit that red button turn it gray you can also go down and throw a thumbs up on our video so we know you guys are enjoying the content coming through to you. All right, let's see here. See if I can bring up a Twitter feed here real quick and check out. Uh, one of the great things we've been seeing are a lot of the virtual yes cards going around. Hopefully you've caught those on Twitter. If you haven't, I wanna see if I can get a little screen share here of those. The yes cards are just recognizing your friends out there that are doing some great work. And the hashtag JCPS dig in is the digital innovation shortened uh, hashtag that we like to track and follow and see what's going on. And you see some of our schedule shots here going out. Some teachers getting their Apple certification. That's excellent. Great time for doing that. Apple certification, Microsoft, uh, Google certification. All of those are very timely. Screencastify would be great right now. Uh, here's a yes card. There we go. Bloom Elementary showing one for Dr. Jacobs. Awesome, good stuff from the staff. Ah, there's Matt Bolka and the JCPS Esports. There's our purple cow, some computer picks. I'm liking this. Ah, there's another one. Ah, Rebecca Reynolds. Yes cards. I'm sure she gets a yes card probably at least a few times a day. Uh, she's an amazing resource for everyone. And reminder, if you go to jcps.me forward slash NTI, you can get to the JCPS NTI support page, which looks a little something like this. You will notice there's a teacher toolkit, a student toolkit, and the NTI parent guardian toolkit. One of the great things on there is that technical support button right in the middle. You click on that, you can get live support from integration department, innovation department, everybody in IT3 will be there to help you out with any problems you, your parents, or students may have. So also when you go to the teacher page inside, you can see the great resources in here. A lot of things that may not be covered in the videos directly. You can come in here, there's Study Island, Edmentum, and then you have our core digital tools, the four tools that we've been talking about the most, Google Classroom, Meet, Screencastify, and Hangouts Phone. And then, of course, some of those excellent certifications I was talking about down here. And our schedule is here. And you will see up next is the 130 time slot and creating and using choice boards with the dynamic duo of Susan Price and Suzanne Kramer. The two Sues are amazing with content and curriculum. And we will see them very soon. Probably now would be a good time if you need to use the restroom, grab a sandwich, whatever it may be. I would do that. If you do have any questions, we have a few of our innovation folks that are in the chat. You can post questions in there. Introduce yourselves. Say hi. Oh, I'm going to come back over here to Twitter real quick and see what's new. the latest on JCPS Digital Innovation. We got the Durham's there. Uh, of course, us plug in our show and make sure everybody knows about the great resources you can find here. Uh, Miss Vanita Burnett is amazing also. Love her. 
Great resource out of Zone 2. Sarah Christie. Oh, there's a double pack of Yes cards there. Amazing. And, and this is the love we need to be sharing right now and that positivity that needs to be out there for everyone because everybody needs that support right now. All right. In 121. Still not 130. Hang tight, all. We will have our next show at 130. I see in the chat we have the wonderful Beverly Compton out of Digital Innovation saying hi to, oh, Miss Michelle Dillard and Jessica Rothenthal. Hello, Miracle Middle Schools. All right, shout out. Awesome. Where do you get a yes card? Russ, if you're in the chat, do you think you could link that for me and I'll approve it on my side? Where they can get the virtual yes cards? Must see TV. I really like that, Ms. Rosenthal. Thank you. You guys are great, and we love having you here. I love seeing every day all of the educators getting together on the channel and sharing so much information and so many resources. The internet is amazingly slow today. I'm going to blame the wind. What do you think? Wind shear. I definitely think that's it. All right. Same stuff here. The derm's hanging out on the top ones there. All right. We've got to get some more tweets in there. <laughs> Thank you, Bev. All right. We have a few more minutes here. Watch this, Jason. Nope. Back up. So a lot of people have been asking throughout the days, and I know some people are new to this, some people are not, but, and they want to know, will these sessions be on the channel somewhere else so that I can watch them? So what you can do is go to YouTube, go to the JCPS Digital Learning Channel, and while well, I'm inside here, so it looks a little bit different for me than it would for you, um, but if you click on videos or you go to our playlist, you will see there are hundreds of videos broken down and if you click on playlists you will see uh, classified support Google support uh, there's social studies there's the Edmentum iPad support 
lots and lots of videos on here on demand as you need them. And what we are doing is you can go back and rewatch the lives and they may be, you know, two, three hours for the ones that have just posted. But what we do is we take and break them up. But before that, you can play the video, go in, and you can look at the transcript and jump to the section you need. Say, oh, I'm going to jump ahead an hour and a half. You don't need to see the first few episodes and you want to see something later in. You can jump ahead. I mean, that's the great thing with YouTube. So you can skip through the video. But also then once we break them up, we will add them to the different playlists. And if you are a subscriber which we are at 3.33 thousand right now, which is amazing. Uh, thank you all for doing that. Makes us feel very loved on our side. Uh, you will get updates whenever we post new videos. Uh, and we had just uh, 10 or so go up on Friday last week, uh, breaking up episodes. So then you can get them in little bite-sized chunks, a little bit easier for some people. And also with like Edmentum, there's a whole section of videos on there. And some of them are only two, three minutes which may be something specific for you. Stop, <laughs> stop playing. Um, they will be shorter. So this is like a four, uh, five minute video right here. There's another four minute one, how to create a course in Edmentum, how to utilize the Edmentum course resources, uh, Edmentum messaging, for sending out information. Uh, how do you do attendance and progress reports, which can help you with uh, NTI reporting, just, uh, flex assignments, so many different things. That's just the Edmentum playlist. And we have several playlists within our channel that may be specific to you. Luckily, we don't need that printer list anymore, right? <laughs> uh, we have STLP going on and hopefully you've seen that. I know uh, Russ Hockenberry has sent out lots of information to people about the wonderful STLP resource of doing STLP from home, that students are able to collaborate, work online, and still turn in their projects. So if you haven't seen that, and I know a lot of you do STLP, check it out so that you can submit your students' work. It's a great way to still get judged and keep them active in school. All right, it is 128. I will stop tap dancing very soon, and I will let Susan and Suzanne take over but they have about two more minutes before I'm going to torture them and make them take over. Hello. And I see Suzanne is also in the chat, which is great. Thank you. That'll help with any questions. Hello. Hello. Hello, Good ladies. Afternoon. How are you? Good. How are you doing on this fine Hello. Tuesday? <laughs> The sun's shining. It's a beautiful day. So yes, you know what? life is good. It is gorgeous out. I agree. So it's 129, Suzanne. I'm ready to get started if you are. Okay. I like it. If you're ready to take it away, I will turn it over to you. Okay. Um, I feel like you have a bright future as a radio DJ. <laughs> have you I, done I have that? a face for radio. Yes. Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> you, you are very good at that um, tap dancing. Okay, I will go ahead and share my screen, Susan, and we will get going. Are we good? No, we, we see your beautiful face, not a presentation. Oh, no. Okay, hold on. That's all right. I'm sorry. That's why we started early, right? Share screen. There we go. There we go. Okay. All right, Susan, I think we're ready now. And okay. if you would, would you please hit closed captioning, the little CC at the bottom in that black button? There you go. Awesome. Are we good? Uh, once you click on that, can you hit the, um, let's bottom. see, bottom. Are they there? No, I'm not seeing them. Well, that's all right. Go. We'll see if they, uh, there you go. Hit allow on that. There you go. Awesome. All yours. All right. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. And um, welcome to um, our um, presentation for um, JCPS Choice Boards. My name is Susan Price. I am the um, 
Director of Curriculum Design and Learning Innovation. And I have with me today, um, Suzanne Kramer, who is our um, middle school ELA lead. And so um, we've started on our quest for choice boards and we've been so excited as we've seen students who have been um, sharing the activities they've been completing with their choice boards on Twitter. We've had emails from teachers asking us to review their choice boards. And so we are really excited that um, choice boards have um, actually We just can't get to you. Cover up, you know, that's right. <laughs> okay, it says I'm live now. So does that mean I took over on YouTube? I can't, I don't see it reflected there yet. Hold there on, it's coming. Oh, there it is, awesome. Yay. Good job, Matt, thanks, okay. Matt. Yeah, it's no problem, man. All right, so uh, I don't know where we just left off, <laughs> so I will let you guys go ahead and take over. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to share my screen and um, we will fly through this. Awesome. All right. Are we seeing what we need to see? I yes. believe so. Yes. Awesome. All right, Susan, I'm going to go to why use choice boards in the classroom. Okay. So we know that a choice board is um, just a, a graphic organizer, basically, that has different amounts of squares. Um, each square represents a learning task or an activity that um, is aligned to the framework. I just lost, did we just lose connection? I'm hearing you, you're okay. No, you're good. That was a notification that came through on my end, so I just had to close it out, sorry. And so why we use choice boards in the classroom really is to um, enhance student motiva motivation and engagement. Um, and teachers are actually able to uh, differentiate the instruction. They um, can give students opportunities to practice um, master concepts taught in class. However, um, you know, when they are structuring these, um, teachers need to just really keep in mind the need for differentiated instruction, varied learning styles, and ensuring that um, the challenges are both interesting and, um, you know, challenging tasks for students because we know that offering student choices empowers them to learn um, to the best of their ability. So basically the power of using a choice board is exactly what it says. Um, it's so that students are able to demonstrate their learning um, in a particular subject or concept in a way that encourages them to be more responsible, accountable and independent um, for their learning. And also it allows students to work at their own pace. So it's, you know, not really best practice to give a child a choice board on Monday and say all the squares are due on Friday. A choice board
a video or something? Because we're presenting again tomorrow. So I just, it's so, okay. <laughs> just, and I mean, it's no one's fault, but yeah. I just think trying to get back on now is just being a little bit more disjointed. We're presenting again tomorrow. So I just, it's so. Uh, Okay. Um, Are we up and running again? Yay, maybe. I don't see the video here. Oh, it's because I didn't select a screen share. Oh my gosh. Okay, here we go. Okay, I think we're in. I just have to send a live. Here we go. Sorry, so everybody. I we only have like seven minutes. Yeah. So how do you want us to proceed with this? Whatever you think is best. <laughs> I'm so sorry again. Okay. Thank you everybody on the, on the stream for bearing with us here. Jim had some internet issues and then my laptop crashed. So I'm um, not really sure what's going on with everything, but um, okay. Does it look okay? Um, no, I think it's frozen. Mm-hmm. Oh man. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. it's still frozen. Yeah, it says yeah, there it looks like there's okay, now it's working. Um can see in here now. Okay, oh. thank you. Are there any questions in the chat that we might just answer since we just have like six minutes? There okay, now people can see us again. Okay, let me do this here. All right, I'm gonna close. Um, okay. Susan, do you just want me to talk about that slide about the instructional piece to kind of carry us out and then ask people to join us tomorrow? Yes, I think that would be great. Okay, um, and what time tomorrow? Uh, 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock, okay, perfect. I'm gonna share my screen and we'll just do that last part or that part and then we'll just be done for today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. is completely blank right now. I can't figure it out. Okay, um, well, we will be back tomorrow at 10 o'clock. <laughs> I am so terrible. <laughs> this is okay. It has nothing to do with you guys, so. No, it's totally fine. We
Because you love our IT3 friends. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Oh, yep. Yeah. Jim picked it back up. Okay. Okay, Jim. Yeah, I can see it. Uh, three minutes of tap dance some more. Yes. Yeah, three minutes of tap dancing, and we'll see you tomorrow. Oh, man. Thank you all. Thanks. See you tomorrow. Yeah, it looks good. I'm seeing it. No. Everyone's coming back tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. that's right. Okay. We look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow for the presentation and we appreciate, we understand and we just want you to know how much we appreciate all of the support that um, our friends, di our digital innovation friends are providing for us. So we'll see you tomorrow at 10. Thank you. Thanks. Good luck. Yes, it is uh, Tanya and Kanita. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, we'll take it. Uh, affirming racial equity tool. Yeah, you know how we like our um, acronyms in JCP. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. It's okay. I was trying to warn you. Can people hear us now? Are we live already? Hi. Yes. Yes, our team is in the chat, but so they're answering by typing, but they can't tell them to us, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Diversity, Equity, and Poverty, also known as DEP. All right, thanks. So, hey, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Oh, what? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. So, 
are you ready for NTI? And we just had a great question. What does ARE stand for? And ARE stands for Affirming Racial Equity. And so we thought that made a great question. So that's why you see us saying, are you, and our hashtag is, are you JCPS? To keep in mind that we want to affirm racial equity in everything we do. And to Kanita, can you go to the next slide? Yes. One of the things that we have shared with teachers around the district, we shared with principals, so hopefully they share with teachers, the AICs and our other teams, is a short version of our original R tool. And we realized that everyone is under a lot of stress during this time and teachers are working really, really hard. So we wanted to kind of distill it down to what are some very necessary things that we can still attend to, to make sure that we are affirming racial equity during this time. So what you're looking at is a copy of the one pager and how it's used is that teachers can look at the descriptors in the middle and think about them as they're planning or if you're using, if you have materials that you're picking up from somewhere and you want to screen them and see if they're aligned with racial equity, these are some good questions to ask yourselves. So we want to make sure that we are having examples from a variety of cultural groups, that we're helping students understand bias, that we are intentionally planning lessons to foster intergroup relations, that we're modifying our strategies and resources to promote achievement, um, particularly from our unrepresented groups, underrepresented groups, excuse me, and that we are recognizing the value of race and culture in our relationship building. And we know relationship building is more key than ever right now. So today's session, we'll be talking about that second one, knowledge construction that's highlighted there for you. So we're looking more closely at, are you helping students understand bias through inquiry? And we can go to the next one. So this is our team. Um, you can see our zones there in the chat. I am Katia Turner and along with me is Kanita Ballard and Lamanda, Rachel and Avon are in the chat. So if you have questions as we're going along, if you need the one pager, if it hasn't gotten to you, um, feel free to ask that in the chat box and they will be there to help you out. Or if there's other things that you need us to stop, slow down, explain, um, please let us know in the chat box. Okay, today's objectives. Today we're hoping that we will be able to help you recognize forms of bias in instructional materials or texts. And then pick a strategy to equip students to recognize and disrupt bias um, as part of their learning. Um, this at the top, seven types of bias, is a link to a lesson from <clears throat> the Anti-Defamation League called Bias Detectives. And so this is a good lesson for students, but it's also um, a good thing for teachers for us to think about as we um, sharpen our equity lens. We started out with a little uh, inspiration from Arrested Development uh, about teaching a man to fish. And so the R tool is really designed to help us all sharpen our equity lens and keep us um, focused on affirming racial equity. So we're just gonna take a few minutes to go through these biases and think about where we might have seen them before. So as we look at knowledge construction for racial equity, are you helping students understand bias through inquiry? So we're gonna start out looking at biases. So the first one is the invisibility bias. So if you have noticed invisibility bias before, feel free to comment in the chat box, give us examples of things that you've seen. Invisi invisibility bias encourages a mindset of out of sight, out of mind. So our students are not seeing themselves represented in text and the message that that sends to society is that 
they're less important, whether it be for ethnicity, whether it be gender, whether it be gender expression, all of these things can be related to bias. And invisibility bias is a big one that we have seen across our curriculum. I just wanted to pause and say, was there any comments out there about invisibility bias? So okay. far, I have not seen any comments or questions, but I will Wonderful. let you know if any pop up. Okay, great. So our next one is gone away. Um, somehow. The next one is imbalance and selectivity bias. And this graphic shows um, Indian history that is being told through a British lens. And so inevitably when there's one perspective, then some of the story is going to be missing. So at the bottom, we have an African proverb to help us remember that um, that particular type of bias until the lion tells his side of the story, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So what we want to remember with imbalance and selectivity bias is that it takes multiple perspectives for us to understand truth. So we have to think about ways that we can help students realize that there's an imbalance and ways that we can give students an opportunity to explore multiple perspectives. Okay, next slide. So the next one is stereotyping bias. This is something that's very common. And this graphic is just showing us some stereotypes that I'm sure we have heard or seen before. Stereotyping is when a small characteristic may be um, magnified or over-exaggerated uh, to minimize the whole person or the whole culture. And so we have to be careful of the types of comments that are made in text that are leading to stereotyping bias. Um, I'm not sure how well you can see the graphic, but there are stereotypes that go along with all different types of ethnicities. And sometimes people view stereotypes as, oh, well, this could be a positive stereotype. But we want to remember that stereotyping um, is always harmful because it minimizes a person's ability to be an individual and um, just categorizes a cultural group. So we can go to our next slide. Our next slide is unreality bias. And here you see our rose colored glasses when we just choose to go through life um, thinking that everything is fine. And the reason I love this image to remind us about what unreality bias looks like is because <clears throat> with the glasses on, you can't even tell that it's raining. And that's one of the things that we need to remember as we're working with students in different populations that we want to be realistic about um, the isms that are affecting their lives. And we want to make sure that they're able to do the same thing. So when they're reading a text, a lot of times you'll see this kind of thing with slavery when you know we're like but the slaves were happy or you know things like that that kind of gloss over or talking about the civil rights movement as if um it's a thing of the past like we marched on washington and now everything is great for everyone and we don't have to think about that anymore those are examples of unreality bias
So the next one is fragmentation and isolation bias. And I have nicknamed this, nicknamed this one hashtag ATW bias. It's kind of that, by the way, it's not as um it's not as egregious as perhaps stereotyping. And it's taking a step forward from complete invisibility. So we have gotten to the place where we recognize, hey, we didn't include everyone. So then we make a marginal effort to include other perspectives. And this is when this is when you see the call out boxes or a special page that's dedicated or um, something like celebrating Black history only during Black History Month. Those are examples of fragmentation and isolation bias. So it's another thing we want students to be on the lookout for. And this is an example out of a textbook of a call out box um, that is helping you to look at African Americans in science. And instead of including them as scientists, as part of the entire study. So that's fragmentation and isolation bias. The next one is linguistic bias. And the main thing to remember here is that words count. I'm not sure how well you can see the screen, so I'm just going to pick out some points from here. But for example, um, Native Americans being described as roaming and wandering versus white Americans being described as traveled or settled as they go westward gives the impression that the white, the white Americans were more goal oriented, that they had a plan, there was a purpose, and that the Native Americans um, lack that purpose. So thinking about how words are used to depict people of different ethnicities are um, examples of language bias. Another one is thinking about words like forefathers, mankind, there we're seeing gender bias. So thinking about how the words are used, whether it's in our math text, whether it's in our social studies, our reading, we want to become detectives to recognize linguistic bias and help our students also to do the same. So that one is linguistic bias. And then this one is cosmetic bias. Here again, we are trying to do better than days gone by and we recognize a need for diversity. And so we have some on the cover. Here we have different ethnicities represented on the cover of the text, but when you dig into the text, how are those ethnicities truly represented? Are their cultures authentically represented throughout the text as integral parts of the information being presented? Or is it kind of just the picture to the side to kind of give you that image without really truly being authentic to that culture? So this is another example of bias that you will find in instructional materials called cosmetic bias. So what does that mean for us as educators in this particular time in history? This is a graphic that we really think speaks to where, what we're going through now. We are all in the same storm. We are not all in the same boat. So we want to remember love before lessons, quality over quantity, and wise feedback over assessment. As you can see, depending on the boat you're in, it's really going to determine what your experience is like. And we have students on all levels of this experience, and we have students without boats at all um, who are really struggling just to stay alive during this time. This could be related to our level of privilege. This could also be related to trauma. And so we really have to take time with our students right now and our families to get to know individually what each one of them is going through. And 
We also want to balance that with being able to provide quality education during this time. We know that there's the gap is going to um, probably be wider because of issues of access um, and just dealing with everything that's going on. So as educators, what can we do to give our students opportunities to think, to grow cognitively and to be engaged over this time? So we're gonna look at some opportunities to include knowledge construction, which is really um, addressing that quality over quantity item. We can go to the next slide, Kamita. Okay, so when we think about how we can include knowledge instruction, knowledge construction uh, for racial equity, these are some points to remember. Knowledge construction explores differences rather than pretending everyone is the same. Um, knowledge construction centers the perspectives of people of color and questions traditional perspectives. And you see that word question come up again. When we're um, using knowledge construction, we want students to question. We want to think on their own and to analyze the information that's being given to them. And so finally, when we're, when we're promoting knowledge construction, we have students that investigate, research, compare, synthesize, evaluate, and create. Next slide. Okay, so that was a lot. And it sounds like so much is going on, but it does not have to be difficult. So knowledge construction can be leveraged through questions. And so when we're thinking about the types of questions that we're having students answer, we already know we're having students answer questions. So how can we tweak those questions to also get them to recognize bias and to think about um, the world around them. So these are some snips from different anchor charts that I have seen. The first one, questions to ask, whose story is this? What bias does the author reveal? Now that one means that we have to have put the word bias in students' vocabularies. And if that's not something that we've done already, then we want to be thinking about how we can um, include that. Whose side of the story is missing? Why? What does the author hope for? And these are the kind of questions that will cause students to think outside the box that will help them to understand that knowledge is shaped, is a, shaped by our social, by our society. And so understanding what they believe is true is um, what they believe is true is shaped by so many different forces. And so they can really push back against those forces. Um, these three questions, whose voice is heard, whose voice is left out and why are a great foundation for students as they're reading text to begin to become biased detectives. Kanina, we can go to the next slide. So strategies that support knowledge construction, reading multiple texts um, on the same viewpoint, so on the same topic. So we want to be able to hear different perspectives and then give students an opportunity to support those perspectives from the text so that they can develop their own opinions of what is happening. Um, questioning the author. We just saw some examples of those um, on those anchor charts. Writing counter text. Writing counter text means that we're changing the story. So how would this story be different if we change the author's ethnicity? How would this story be different if we move the setting into my neighborhood? These are ways that students can um, begin to interact with text in a ways that push them to higher order thinking. Student choice research projects. Those are things that support knowledge construction because students are asking their own questions and they're motivated by their own desires to learn. 
and then taking social action. So many things are going on around us right now that are just begging for students to be involved. And in some ways they don't have a choice, but to know what's going on. So this is a great opportunity for us to allow students to begin to take social action. So on the right side, hand side of this slide are some links to some resources that can help with some of these strategies. The first is teaching tolerance. One is student text. So there are different grade levels. So you can search those and see what topics you're teaching and how you can provide multiple perspectives by having students read multiple texts. The second one has to do with student, student tasks, and that's about how students are writing and looking for different perspectives. The next two are more about student choice and research projects. They're resources that have uh, become available recently since COVID-19 that will help us give students who have access um, opportunities to do those kinds of research projects. And then the last one is a kid's guide to social action. So that can give, those are lessons that are in there and different projects that are already um, laid out for you. So teachers can use this as a resource to think about how they're planning their own PBLs in the upcoming weeks. And we can go to the next slide, Kanita. So here are some more examples for maybe more middle and high school. We've talked a lot about questions related to knowledge construction, and I hope that's something that we can hold on to and remember that using questions is a simple way to get students thinking and to um, bump up the rigor. Um, this is a giant list of really good essential questions. And some of them are listed here. What is oppression and what are the root causes? So we can see how that could support racial equity, that sort of investigation. How are prejudice and bias created? How do we overcome them? And if you go into this, if you click this image, it takes you to the website. There's lots more questions and they are put into different categories. So there's a whole question, there's a whole section for social justice. Um, there's some around culture and values. So those are good ways to get students' minds moving in the right direction. And I wanna say I attended a virtual PD uh, maybe last week about teachers creating choice boards based on um, questions, supporting questions and essential questions. And I think that would be a great, um, tie-in to how we can support racial equity through knowledge construction. So thinking about how we're getting perspective. Um, the next one, Disrupt Text, is a, a kind of a blog where educators have seen different texts in the canon and they're talking about how they see bias in those texts. Kanita, can you click on that one? for me and just kind of scroll down because I see some titles that I recognize. So if you are teaching Shakespeare or The Crucible or Gatsby or To Kill a Mockingbird, these people are doing the work of questioning the text and looking for bias. And so going to these resources will help you as an educator understand what that looks like and give you ideas of ways you can use your students. Thank you, Kanita, we can go back to, and then this last one, the marginal syllabus, you do have to, they had some um, live sessions, but they're, they're linked here, and you can go back and look at the conversations that they're having. This is about having students annotate texts as they question them, and they also have a community so you can join. It's a free membership. You know, teachers love to get free memberships um, so that you can be a part of that community as you're looking for ways to help your students to grow cognitively. Um, we have to be realistic about the times that we're in and know that we're not going to see the same um, 
type of testing, but also to think about this is an exciting time to see how we can change education, how we can be more true to what we want students to know and be able to do. So we have these resources out there for you. If you have questions for us, feel free to um, reach out to us. Um, Kanita, can you go to the next, go like to the end, I think. There we are. So here's our contact information. Does anyone have any questions that came up or thoughts we're thinking right now? Well, that is all we have for you. Feel free to reach out. We're listed there by zone and we would be happy to help you use the R tool checklist for NTI to join a planning session or PLC. All right. Thank you, ladies. That was good, good information for people. Uh, lots of great comments. Appreciating the explanations of the uh, the colorblind statement. I like that. That was good because a lot of people say, oh, well, I don't see color. Well, then you're not really being equitable then if you're not acknowledging it. Um, so good information. We have about four minutes left and I do apologize. We're having a spotty connection. There's some outages going on with YouTube right now and we're trying to deal around those. Um, so if you keep losing, you have a little bit of a misconnection. It's not you. It's everyone. Um, it, it's on our side too. So it is not you. Don't try to turn off your machine or restart. It is going around today. And we check out our schedule. And we just covered the NTI and the ARE with our DEP friends. And the next thing we have up is adding Spark to your NTI lessons. And that will kick off at 2.30. So we've got a couple minutes here. We're going to see how our connection goes. I'm going to drop back and then pop back in and see if that cleans up anything. Not likely, but I'll try. So hang Appreciate you guys sticking with us through these amazing NTI struggles. Thank you all for your patience and support. We have 2.30. I know our stream is still a little sketchy. Bear with us and we will hopefully get that hammered out and get a better connection. I do see that we have Jennifer, Lindsay, and Tiffany in the bottom row. How are you doing today, ladies? Good. How are you? Uh, not too bad. Uh, for those of you just joining us and the ladies there, uh, my name is Jim Unger from JCPS Digital Innovation. 
hosting the JCPS Digital Learning Channel on YouTube Live for the most part. I will tell you, just be warned, ladies, that it is a little bit sketchy today on our connection. So if I stop you, I apologize. Would you remind me how to turn on the closed caption piece, Jim? Absolutely. Uh, are you attempting to share your screen right now because we're seeing your awesome face? No, not yet, but oh, okay. that when I'll get that message. <laughs> when when you... I get the shares. <laughs> um, when you go into your slides and you're in present mode, at the very bottom in the little black bar, about halfway over, you'll see a little white CC. Okay. You click on that and then it'll pop up to access your microphone. Uh, allow it to do that. Well, I was looking for it to, beforehand. I want them to see my face for a second and then I'm going to, they're not going to see my face. <laughs> well, we're getting a lot of it right now because I locked on you. <laughs> oh, great. <Okay. laughs> are you ready for us to begin? Um, we are ready whenever you are ready. Okay. Lindsay. Okay. So we are here today to talk about some creative strategies um, to add spark to your NTI lessons. And these are quick, we call them grab and go strategies because you can take them immediately and implement them into your NTI lessons um, without a lot of preparation. Um, my name is Lindsay Dodderweik. I am one of the gifted itinerant teachers and I work with um, four elementary schools in the district um, with their gifted and talented students. All right, hi, I'm Tiffany Morrison. I am the same uh, in the same position that Lindsay's in. I am a gifted and talented itinerant teacher, and I also work with four elementary schools in the district. And I'm excited today to show you some of these strategies. And I'm Jenny Stith. And you cannot see me anymore because I think I'm sharing my screen. This is a little confusing. So now can everyone see my screen? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. I don't see the option for the closed caption, Jim. Is that something I need to do? Okay. Have I not presented it saying I'm presenting? So let me try it again. Uh, yeah. For us, it was not showing presented. Okay. Um, one minute, screen. everyone. Oh, be patient. Right with me. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. My entire screen. There we go. There's your screen. Okay. And now the closed caption piece. I still don't see. Um, I'm not seeing your slides. Okay, now. There's your slides. Okay. And if you click present. Which I've done multiple times and it says I'm sharing my screen currently. So go up to present your slides, Jenny, like up where you normally present slides. There you go. Oh, thank and now you. Now on the bottom bar down there, you'll see where it. it says caption. There you yes. are. Yep, yep, yep. You got it. Okay. Thank you all for being patient. No problem. Well, good afternoon, no problem. JCPS. I'm excited to present, as we said, um, adding a little spark to your NTI lessons. And so we're going to begin with some norms and um, with this new type of living, we still want to have norms. So I would just ask that you be present during our presentation and please utilize the chat. I've got Tiffany and Lindsay who are monitoring that and can answer questions and then we'll switch those roles around as we move forward through the presentation. I also want everyone to assume good intentions. So if for some reason we hear you or have the noise. Um, just make sure everything's on mute. We want you to respect perspectives. And um, if you hear ideas that don't resonate with you, just be open to them. And of course, we always want you to be inclusive. And these strategies that we're going to share with you today are um, uh, can go across any content area. And so we really enjoyed 
this book. This is where we got all of our ideas, um, sparking student creativity, practical ways to promote innovative thinking and problem solving. This book has changed my outlook on teaching and I've been doing gifted for five years and just her ideas and her grab and go strategies really make implementing creative thinking much easier into your um, ideas. So I hope you can take some of these strategies, the slides where the um, you can access them on the virtual training site and you can just click on our names if you want to access after we're done presenting today. So one of my favorite strategies, as teachers, we are required to ask lots of questions. And in observing teachers and in my own observations, we tend to ramble off low level recall questions off the top of our head. We've been told that we have to write down questions or plan ahead for high level questions. Well, Patty, uh, Patty Derry Pew's diversifying questions with these five little tweaks, you can ramble these off off the cuff, which I like as a teacher because oftentimes we do have to think of questions quickly. So she says, take your normal who, what, when, where, why, and change that into some of these five diversifying questions. One of them is what would happen if? Children love hypotheticals anyway, and believe it or not, it's in um, reinforcing critical thinking the second you make a child um, ask what if questions. Also, please keep in mind that you wanna keep these within the context of your lesson. Don't let them go so far off the edge that it doesn't even make sense because we want you to be critically thinking, not just creative, okay? That's important. We have to get the content and the creative piece meshing together. Unusual uses. Oftentimes, if you have the kids brainstorm unusual use, uses for different things, um, it's very high level thinking and it's easily asked when you're reading a text or reading about a person. You can throw these questions in quickly. Product improvement. I think this lends itself well to science and things when you're looking at different tools, but also you could use it anywhere. Have kids brainstorm how things could be improved. Um, one recent example is just how could they improve their day today during COVID-19? We all have things that we want to change. And so just a simple question of how could your day be improved? Something that simple is really getting kids high level thinking. Perspective taking. This one is just asking students to look at things from a different point of view. It's very helpful. One of my favorite um, reasons I like this strategy is it builds empathy. When you ask kids to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, it really does make them think about what that would be like. Therefore, thinking very high level and also building empathy for others. And then, of course, a good old effective one is cause and effect. And just anytime you have kids recognizing cause and effect relationships in writing and in text and in day to day, that's high level thinking. Now, I'm going to give it a minute of some awkward silence. And I've learned that on virtual training, silence seems forever when it's I'm going to give you about 10 seconds. A look at the questions all my members this is your engagement piece I'm asking for I want you to think about a question you could throw out to your kids tomorrow or if you're an AIC how could you use this to help your staff and if you look across at my examples the top row is social studies the next row down is math the question the row after that is science and then of course my favorite at the bottom is ELA so I'm going to give you a moment. I want you to either write an example that you could ask a question using one of these five or a way you could use this resource with your staff. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay, so what does that mean, come back? Do you have a time? I mean, I want you to do whatever Heather um, wants us to do. She is the big dog. Absolutely. Um, 
I will, until I get the official word from her, I will let you continue on. I just want to kind of give you a warning that we may be taking this down because we are very spotty. Uh, I know we have a great connection ourselves, but there's been issues with YouTube throughout the day today kicking us out and nobody on my team can get a good connection. Okay, do you want me to just continue then for now? Yeah, I was just trying to give you a warning. Okay, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem. Okay, the second strategy that I'm going to present today is called transformation and one of the examples that was given in the book is the difference between a rhombus and a trapezoid so they suggested you give half the class during a, maybe a, a virtual training or a, when you're meeting with your kids or even in a google classroom assignment where you're not actually engaged talking to them but give half of them a trapezoid half of them a rhombus and then you tell the students